I imagine that most of you have been exposed to Albert Camus' essay, A Myth of Sisyphus, at some point, the ending of which I read an abbreviated version of a few moments ago. In the mythology of ancient Greece, the story of Sisyphus was one among many cautionary tales where arrogance and overreach by humans or gods led to tragic ends, or at least to creative and torturous punishments in the afterlife. Various moral tales, Icarus flew too high, his wings were melted by the sun, and he falls to his death. Prometheus stole fire from the gods to give it to humanity, and so Zeus condemned him, chained to a rock where a huge eagle would devour his liver, an act repeated daily for eternity. And our friend Sisyphus, he got into trouble with the gods more than once, but his biggest error was reneging on the deal with Pluto. And as we heard, they sent Mercury to retrieve him and proceeded to sentence him to eternal punishment with the rock. When I was in seminary, I took a preaching class from Bill Schultz, a very distinguished UU minister. He had been president of the Unitarian Universalist Association and then went on to serve as president of Amnesty International. Bill was a good teacher, and he tried to enrich his course with material that would motivate and inspire us as sermonizers. The myth of Sisyphus was one such piece. Bill included it to demonstrate that we could always find a source of hope. This jibed with his feeling that when we preach, However difficult the material, we should always leave you, our congregants, with a piece of hope. I don't know if I do that. You can tell me. And why does a guy endlessly rolling a stone up a hill bring a message of hope? Well, it had to be because Camus closed his essay with the surprising conclusion that one must imagine Sisyphus happy. I had some difficulty with the interpretation that this is a hopeful message. I communicated that to Bill, and he told me I didn't understand the essay. <laughs> and I've been thinking about it ever since. And that's why I decided to talk about it today. Backing up a bit, Camus wrote this in the early 1940s, as the Germans were in the process of occupying France. The climate of wartime and the onset of devastation wrought by fascism was quite prevalent in Europe. Most intellectuals were turning away from religion and looking for ways to understand life's meaning in the absence of God. After over a thousand years, where meaning had been defined solely through our relation to God. This wasn't easy. Without God, the discrepancy between human aspiration and the reality of the world becomes acute. It was easy to see alienation and futility in the human condition, especially during those times, bleak times. Camus recognized the presence of a basic human need to attribute meaning and direction to life. But he fully believed that the universe responded to our need with unreasonable silence. This is the recipe for absurdism, where humanity grounds expectations and rationality, which is in direct conflict with the irrational and uncooperative world. This fact of human existence poses a philosophical problem. We can move forward in ignorance, but once we become conscious of this absurdity, our only effective choices are limited. Indeed, Camus spent a good part of the essay speaking of suicide. He felt the primary philosophical question facing us is why live? And 
although he discussed suicide as his solution to meaningless, he dismissed it. I didn't quite understand why, but I think he had dismissed it because it was the easy way out. We weren't dealing with what we faced. He concludes that the contradictions must be lived, that reason and its limits must be acknowledged without bringing sources of false hope. However, he also claims that the absurd should never be permanently accepted. We should be conscious of it, but that doesn't mean we have to buy into it. It demands constant confrontation and revolt on the part of humanity. With this view, Sisyphus does come off as a tragic hero. Because he is fully conscious of his wretched situation, he has no hope of improving it. But according to Camus, there is no fate that cannot be surmounted by scorn. Sisyphus becomes the rebel, not in action, but in mind. By accepting his fate, he becomes free to realize its absurdity and to reach a state of continuing acceptance. In this way, he can be imagined as happy. If indeed we choose absurdity as the primary human situation, which I question, I don't see the message that we can adapt to it in a purposive way to hold much of a message of hope. Survival, maybe. Persistence, maybe. But hope, no way. In the single metaphor of Sisyphus and his rock, Camus, take, Camus takes on the biggest philosophical question, which is what is the meaning of life? I personally find that his relegation of the question to strategies for dealing with life's innate absurdities falls a little short of the mark. I spent a lot of time in many years here promoting the importance of our search for meaning and purpose in our lives. I do agree that this is the fundamental philosophical and theological question we face, with or without God involved in our thinking. We ask you all to be seekers of truth, to ask questions of the mystery, and to engage one another as you work to process and understand what you find. If I believe that there was a meaning, or a truth, the message would be very different. But although we share many core values, I believe the entire notion of meaning and purpose is relativistic and unique. It is discrete for each person, not so much as a characteristic of their independent identity, but as a marker of their ways of engaging with the social and natural world location in which they exist. We are and we evaluate what we know, what we see, what we feel. The psychologists break meaning into several components. I'm sure the psychologists break it into all kinds of things. But this is just one set of them, each related to the other. And these are different dimensions of meaning. One is we like things to have coherence, to know why things happen and how they fit together. Our cognitive map of how things work. It might be wrong, but this is what we use to comprehend our space. In a sense, seeing this sense of coherence is seeing meaning in what happens. On the other hand, we like to think in terms of purpose to realize that we hold goals, ambitions, and expectations. Our purpose is one reason of seeing the reason we are alive. Besides for being having a sense of coherence in the world and a sense of purpose in what we do, we also like to feel significant, to believe that our lives matter that the world would be different without us. Think George Bailey, and it's a wonderful life. In the myth of Sisyphus, 
Camus was mostly claiming a problem of human insignificance and describing the absurd as our complete lack of control over our own affairs. And there are always ways that this is true. How many of you have felt futility during the past few years as you faced a crazy political order, a worldwide pandemic, increased expressions of hatred and exclusion, world avoidance on issues of climate change, and the persistence of violence and poverty in our midst? There's no reason you shouldn't feel powerlessness in some ways in the face of those kinds of things. It's a sane response. If we look at the big picture, the state of the world, we can feel that our personhood is being undermined and there is little we can do to change things. But we also know that things do change, that they can change, and sometimes it happens through the aggregating and collecting our aspirations and shifting the general normative order that helps form human values, that helps guide societal actions. As persons, we are typically weak and we have little influence. As people in groups, we can be stronger. To get a little more local and moving away from philosophy, the Pew Foundation recently asked a bunch of Americans about meaning in their lives. And they asked several ways, because there's methodological questions about how you elicit responses. In an open-ended question, where they just ask people, what provides you with a sense of meaning and allowed people to bring their own answers, 69%, and you can pick more than one, 69% of people mentioned family, 34% career, 23% money, and 20% spirituality and faith. These were the top four that people nominated. In a closed-ended question, where they selected from a list of possible responses, they were asked to note things that provide a great deal of meaning and fulfillment in their lives. And again, 69%, the same number, said we're family. But 47% selected being outdoors. 47% said spending time with friends. And things like religious faith and career and some of the other things they mentioned on their own were lower on the list. Ignoring a detailed examination of this, and it's broken, the Pew Report goes on, it's broken down by age and region and ethnicity and all kinds of things. We can see that family connections are constantly at the top and that a variety of relations and activities are nominated by different people. Some included spirituality and religion, professions, music, reading, health, education, and other things besides what we mentioned earlier. Meaning, this tells me, is where we decide to place it, where we invest our time, our emotion, our sense of self. And while it's quite possible that many people can feel isolated, alienated, displaced, or ignored in some ways, there are almost always other ways for them to become connected, and invest it in some meaningful way in their lives. When they can't, that is human tragedy. It's also likely that many people find meaning in things and places that might seem to be lower value connections if we want to be judgmental. But that's a different fight. Clearly, we work to influence the kinds of things people pay attention to, but we must always agree that some folks are just different and into different kinds of things. What is clear, though, is that we choose what we attend to, and our presence for different things greatly affects their influence in our lives. This is the mutually reinforcing circle of you look at what you like, and you tend to like what you look at. 
Camus rightly identifies this by saying that the absurd he witnessed was of no importance until a person became aware of the conflict between their aspirations and the possibilities that the world allowed. You can honestly feel powerless. You cannot honestly feel powerless until you try in vain to influence an outcome. We tend to deeply encourage presence to self. When I say we, I probably mean we here. As you work to learn your own feelings about what is meaningful in life and what you feel your purpose may be. This is not a new idea. Practices for contemplation, self-examination, meditation, and visioning have been used for as long as people have tried to understand themselves. And while it's important to work on such things, it also is important not to try too hard. Very few people I know, and I know many theologically minded folks, would claim that the search for meaning ranked near the top of their own list of things that bring them meaning. Hyperactive engagement of this type is almost always counterproductive. Our lives should help us taste and experience enough things so that we have real choices in what we do. One writer refers to the Dorothy strategy from The Wizard of Oz, where she said, if I ever go looking for my heart's desire again, I won't look any further than my own backyard, because if it isn't there, I never really lost it to begin with. I like the thought that when I finish a sermon, I should usually leave you with some message of hope or the possibility for hope. I seriously doubt that it will draw on the happiness that Camus, Camus imagined for Sisyphus. That is a happiness I wouldn't wish on anyone. But I can tell you that you should not abandon hope. Some things will take far more time and work than we might imagine, but by living well, we might be pushing that needle ever so slightly in the direction we hope for. And in the meantime, we can create and seek meaning for ourselves in the lives we know and continue to pursue the things and the relations that we care about. So be it, blessing be.